This is part one of the Full and Bloom interview with producer Matt Wallace. In this segment, Matt talks about recording Faith No More's breakout album, The Real Thing. With your relationship with Faith No More, I know it starts when you guys are basically kids, right? Yeah, we were college. They were about probably like 19. I was 21. And um, yeah, we met. We were, uh, a couple of us were going to UC Berkeley. And uh, yeah, I put up ads, uh, like little flyers in all the cool record stores and the um, what places what bands would rehearse. And then Bill Gould saw that uh, one of my ads and had a band that he was producing. So I produced the, that band. He produced that band on my A track. And then he, he said he had his own band called Sharp Young Men. And so I did their demos, and they turned into Faith No Man, and then eventually, with some personnel changes, turned to Faith No More. And when does Chuck come into the picture? Oh, uh, he comes into the picture uh, sometime after that. I mean, they were kind of without, they had like a rotating group of singers, that included Courtney Love, I think Joe Pye, a bunch of other people. And then Chuck came into the picture, you know. When I was looking on the net, it, it looked like Chuck actually recorded some of the original uh, demos for the real thing. Were those demos just like done on their own, or or were you a part of those demos? Uh, I don't think Chuck did any demos for the real thing. Not that I remember. I mean, we, we did demos for Introduce Yourself, probably. I know we did demos for Care a lot now at my track studio. We may have done some for Introduce Yourself there or a place called Fantasy Dog, but I don't remember Chuck doing any demos for the real thing because he had been out of the picture by for some time. And, uh, and, you know, and the band was rehearsing without him and writing music. So I don't ever recollect Chuck doing any demos for the real thing. I could be proven wrong, but I'm pretty sure he never just he never heard those those uh, these of these because the uh, he and the band had split up uh, a good year or so prior to that record. So. What were you saying right there? Uh, well, Chuck and the band had split up for a good year prior to the real thing. They, we were rehearsing down in L.A. We were, I mean, at least nine months. I mean, I, I, just, I just never remember Chuck doing any demos for the real thing. I mean, not with me, maybe somebody else, but not with me. So they got rid of Chuck without having Mike kind of um, in the wings? Yeah, no, of course not. They just they just basically you know, they they broke up because uh, they didn't want to work with Chuck, and they basically the band kind of fell apart and kind of everyone kind of quit, and then they regrouped after Chuck was out of the picture, and then the Pat was found after the fact. What was it like working with Chuck? Uh, well, I, I, I loved working with him. I thought his uh, he always kind of had his heart on his sleeve, and he wrote about things that were really emotional and true to him. Uh, obviously not near the singer of Mike Pat by a long shot, but certainly a, a good uh, rapper. And I just I like his melodies, I like his songs, and they're really good. Just um, but you know the bottom line that he just didn't. He felt uh, like I don't think he felt that he deserved to make it uh, or something. I don't know if he was afraid of success or afraid of failure, but he definitely thwarted it. Um, you know along the way, and, uh, and the band, first the band wanted to make it, so they they wanted to find a kindred spirit who was really willing really to push forward and try to you know, go. You guys recorded the real thing at Studio D in Sausalito, right? Yep. And what was it like working at that studio? Well, it was great. I mean, it worked out before we did the track in for uh, uh, Introduce Yourself there. Then we went down to L.A. to do the overdubs for Introduce Yourself. So the real thing, we just did it all at Studio D because we were familiar with it. We liked it, and we had had success there before, and we had a, a big enough budget that we could stay there this time, whereas in the past, we could only afford a couple weeks of track, and then we went to L.A. to quote unquote save money by working at a cheaper studio. Do you recall what kind of board they had? Oh yeah, Trident. Either Trident A range or Trident TSM. How long did that record take to record? Uh, about two months from start to finish, from beginning of uh, 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 rehearsals to finish mix. I think it was just about two months. It's pretty quick. Do you remember what the budget was for that record? The real thing was low budget by industry standards at that time. I mean, it was, it was like or seventy grand, which is which is low for that era. We would get like a hundred fifty thousand to make a record on up to you know, a quarter of a million and, and uh, up from there. But we uh, we always worked very lean and mean, and just uh, didn't have a, we didn't have a pile of money, so we just kind of made the best of what, what we could. And, and making that record, we had one drum kit, one Marshall half stack, one Gibson Flying B electric guitar, one Gibson Grabber bass, an amp, and a Emacs keyboard. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, let's try this amp or let's try that guitar. It was like, we had one of everything. That's a testimony to our <clears throat> creativity and, and uh, you know, just, yeah, 
yeah, I mean, that's really what it was. I mean, I think we all just pushed as far as we could with what we had, made, made as much of a unique and eclectic racket as we could with the limited tools we had. Was that a hard record to make with the new edition, or did it go easier, or was it about the same compared to the prior record? Oh, no, it was definitely easier. Yeah, it was easier because everybody was pulling in the same direction. I mean, everyone was ready to go, you know. The, the only uh, challenge was that Patton was still, his heart was still with Mr. Bungo, so I think he... Uh, wasn't completely fully invested in Faith No More at that point in time. He was kind of still finding his way. and I think he had a little bit of a professional distance from it. In spite of writing amazing lyrics and amazing uh, melodies, I think he was still torn between his band of friends that he, he had known since he was in like, high school, uh, Mr. Bungle, and then joining this new band, you know, Faith No More. So that was a bit of ambivalence, which is reflected uh, in some of the lyrics on that album. But, uh, but obviously, when he stepped up to the mic, I mean, he delivered, and he was, I think he was 100% when we were recording, but I think internally he had uh, some ambivalence. Is there a memory that kind of stands out from those recording sessions? Uh, just, uh, uh, I think we, we, we got the guitar tones right because we had like a ton of microphones on them, and we tried to record the guitars without equalization, so we tried to get as much of a holistic and fundamental sound as we could. That was really cool. Jim and I spent a lot of time working on that. Um, uh, me arguing with Pat was just singing a fuller voice because he, he had an amazing voice. He could sing at least as good as, if not better than Chris Cornell, but you could never tell because he was always singing in kind of a nasally, kind of adolescent kind of vibe. And so he and I used to go round and round about that. Frustrating to hear him sing so beautifully in between takes. But to his credit, he was right. He was creating a persona, especially with the song Epic. It had more of a, you know, adenoidal, uh, you know, angsty, young person's vibe, and I think he was absolutely correct. I mean, technically, I, I think we could have gotten a better uh, tone, but I think his, his approach and his vibe was absolutely spot on. How would you record his vocals back then? Uh, I don't know, microphone. Did you have a specific mic you like to use on his voice? Uh, I, I can't remember. I mean, it was, you know, this was like what, 30 years ago, probably a, a 414, AKG 414, probably, but I don't really know. The other thing I do remember is that I went, went to uh a DBX-166, which was a dual compressor. So I I extra compressed his voice while recording, and I extra compressed it while mixing. So uh, for better or for worse, I, I probably did the wrong thing uh, in terms of, you know, good sonics, but it certainly worked in terms of vibe and attitude. And you just did that because you thought uh, it was worth committing to tape? Yeah, I wanted to uh, reduce his dynamics so his voice would be right in your face no matter what he did. So I had a an easy compressor, like a two to one to start with, and I had like a, a brick wall and a ten to one like limiter at the end of it, and uh, did that while recording. I ran his voice to that same thing while mixing, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I just wanted his voice to be front and center and absolutely just focused and you know taking the prisoners. So that was kind of the approach. You know, with his nasally voice on that, he really never brought that back. Dang, you know, that's actually a really good point, and I think it's because he was taking on a persona to kind of protect himself and he wasn't fully in the band when we made the real thing. I think he was kind of a persona of himself in the real band in, in Faith and More and he was his real self in Mr. Bungo but then when you listen to Angel Dust it's really Patton. He's singing he's, he's absolutely 100% in he's singing with his full voice he's using his voice as an instrument and I think he was I think I think Angel Dust was the first record that Patton really owned and and got into you know uh, fundamentally and at the, at the at the ground floor and was was there. So I think that was the first real Faith and More record with Patton. Whereas the real thing was kind of a trans transitorial record where he was uh, you know he had his feet in two different boats. You know one boat was going to Mr. Bungle, one was going towards Faith and More, and he was trying to balance the two and and try to stay uh, loyal to his buddies in Mr. Bungle, but obviously trying to you know. Uh, check out this opportunity to be in Faith the more. So I think that's what was happening. Was there a reason why you didn't do that first Mr. Bungle record? Uh, yeah, I, I turned it down. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat, yeah, Pat asked me to do it, and I probably should have done it, but it's just not my kind of music, and I have to work on things that, that uh, kind of connect with me. Um, and I just I just found the Mr. Bungle stuff just really obnoxious, and I didn't particularly like it. Uh, but in retrospect, I should have done it, because I don't think Pat never really forgave me for turning it down, because he, he got mad at me. Uh, after that, so just one of my kind of music. I mean, I appreciate how good they were, how how physically adept and accomplished they were, but I just was not into that kind of music. And to me, I mean, you can map out Mr. Bungle 
very easily. It's like uh, play something for four bars, make a left turn. Play something, play another thing for four bars, make a left turn. It was just this thing that kept happening, and um, it right. just wasn't my cup of tea. Yeah, and it was like it was like you know, it was like you know, sophomoric, you know, you know, uh, video game playing, dirty guys kind of music, and just again, really accomplished musicians, really a tremendous amount of talent there, but just not. My, my style of music and I probably should, I should have done it it probably would have been a really cool record to make and I probably would have got a lot of cool uh, potential other bands to work with after that but anyway I had to follow my gut I can still remember listening to it for the first time and thinking man that's gonna change music forever but it could have been the um, the hit of LSD do you think Mr. Bungle was gonna change music forever or the real thing I did. Well, the real thing uh, came in and I thought did change it. I can still remember going back and being completely burned out with the 80s sound or just all the 80s music. And kind of even if I go before that, I was into like soul music and Rick James when I was younger and and really into that stuff. And I just remember it hit a it, uh, it hit a wall at some point where I felt like it it wasn't growing. Same thing I felt right. with the 80s, and I can just remember finding that um, the real thing and, yeah. and thinking, I thought it did save music, but Mr. Bungle yeah. was one of those that I just thought, holy shit, I just thought that record was uh, going to kind of change sort of the structure of music. Like you said, go four bars and then next and, and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mr. Bungle was just too limited in scope, I think, to really... Uh, be groundbreaking or make the impact that, that the real thing. The real thing actually crossed over. I mean, it was like they're an indie band and they crossed over to pop radio, which was unheard of uh, for, uh, for rap metal, which had been on the radio and celebrating the forum. So that was truly groundbreaking and genre defining. And I had uh, got corn and, and all these other bands were like, you know, getting a hold of me after that record. I mean, you know, Hoopa Stank and uh, uh, System of a Down, all these people, when they heard the real thing, that was like the groundbreaking record was Uncle. Yeah, I mean, it's just bungled to me. It's just very uh, the smaller audience. Again, still exceptional, but you know, it's kind of like Frank Zappa. I mean, Frank Zappa was really cool, but he never really broke through the mainstream. There's a lot of cool people that that you know, or Captain Beefheart or people like that were there. They inspire a lot of bands, but they never make it to the top. That ride that they took on the real thing seems like uh, almost a mistake with just their style of music. Uh, just almost like. Uh, a freak occurrence rather not a mistake yeah. but just a freak occurrence yeah, yeah. that they um yeah. hit it that big i think you're yeah, you're absolutely correct we just went from smash to warner brothers and warner brothers i mean i can't count how many times they're like man we love this record but you know radio's just not going to play it sorry you know and just, i heard that we heard that so many times and because the, the band toured across the united states like three or four times in a van they went to england a couple times they generated the momentum to where it finally busted on through and uh even MTV had that video for Epic, and they sat on it for six months before they did anything with it. So it's really, it was kind of a freak occurrence, and uh, it's really by virtue of the band pushing so incredibly hard while during their touring and uh, making, I think, exceptional records. I mean, that's what it was about. As far as Epic goes, do you have any kind of notion that you thought that song was going to blow up like that? Uh, I don't think I did. I know the band. It was really interesting because while we were making that record, all the guys in the band thought we were making a pop record. And I was like, ah, I don't know what kind of pop music you guys listen to, but I don't think this is a pop record, you know, because it was just so, you know, it was medley and had rap, and, and so it didn't feel like a pop record to me. But they certainly thought it was, and they were correct. <laughs> yeah, I came from a pop background. I, I worked on some of those more melodic and pretty and stuff like that. I mean, along with like, uh, ugly stuff, too. Uh, but my idea of what Bob was was not what they Paul was able to accomplish, and they, but they were totally correct. Anything stand out from the song Surprise Your Dead? Uh, I know it was an old song that Jim had around. Does anything stand out in particular on that song? Yeah, it's just brilliant. It's just brilliant. I mean, it was, I remember it was a little difficult for Mike Borden to get his head around the click because the, the click goes on to the offbeat when it does all the tempo change stuff. But uh, but other than that, just just ferocious, amazing blistering, uh, exciting. I mean, everything about it is, is just a thrill. I just, the whole thing is a thrill. It was interesting, my daughter, when she was like 11 or 12, she and I used to sing that song together. <laughs> Don't 